Let's see. We are live. Hi. Hey. Hi, hi, hi. So I am Kelly Swingler and I am joined today by my fabulous friend from over the water, the lovely Laura. Hey, Laura. Hi, Kelly. I'm so okay. excited for this conversation today. So Kelly and I normally have these conversations privately on Zoom and then we realize people need to hear what we're talking about. So yeah. we're having another call today for you. Well, all we're doing it. Yeah. And we were just saying that we think we may even make this a regular occurrence. So uh, we shall see how we go. And then we're going to stream it in as many places as we possibly can do to get more and more of the, of the conversation going. So we're hoping we're live. <laughs> we don't know. Live on my side, so we should be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're hoping we're live. Uh, but failing that, we are recording as well. So if you are missing us live, um, this will be posted on YouTube later, so you could, you'll be able to you'll be able to catch it up there. But I suppose Laura and I today wanted to talk about this kind of boundary setting, and we were just kind of said I think there's probably so many different angles that we can take take this conversation. And Laura and I could talk for hours uh, on on all of this stuff. I think we've scheduled it an hour for today. But I think initially this conversation had come from from our own kind of personal experience, really, hadn't it? So we had been we've been having regular conversations. We have regular conversations anyway, but I think more so during lockdown. And I think one of the last times that we were catching up, there was a conversation like you were being asked, you know, can you do all of this for me for free? And I was being asked, can you do all of this for me for free? And that's where you kind of shared this this quote from. So give give me give us the quote. What was the quote? Yeah. So the quote that I heard years ago from a friend who heard it from another friend is "Givers must set limits because takers never do." And I think the idea there is that some of us are just naturally built as more of givers. Some are more takers. No judgment. We're all built differently. Many of us in HR or recruitment or the space around HR, like coaching and consulting, we're naturally givers. It gives us great joy. Uh -huh. um, but there is, and there is this kind of element of then we take on just too much, especially yeah. in a time of crisis. I remember back in March, you and I both said, you know, we feel so called to serve in a time of crisis. We feel like yeah, we have, it's one of our superpowers is to give and to be generous. Um, so it's a tricky one because we don't want to change who we are, but we also need to learn when it's okay and appropriate to say no and to try and kind of change yeah. the tune a little bit. Yeah, and that was and that was a big thing, wasn't it? Because I think we had both said, you know, I think particularly at, at the beginning of lockdown, and I'm hugely grateful, touch as much, much wood as I possibly as I possibly got. Like I'm really grateful for the fact that you know still got clients we're still working we've, we've still got all of all of those all of those people that we're able to work with but we also at the beginning of lockdown and we haven't stopped but we were doing lots of blogs we were doing lots of podcasts we were having lots of conversations we were doing lots of interviews because we wanted to we wanted to help HR. Like we knew that HR were going to have more pressure, and we knew that HR were working and are still working stupid hours and pushing and pushing and pushing. Whether that's helping with furlough or redundancies or closures or the kind of business as usual stuff. But I, I mean, I suppose I don't know. Like, do you think in some way the fact that we wanted to kind of be of service in that way that kind of put us out there with like this big, you know, kind of free for all uh like across our forehead it's like okay so yeah I, I want those people but i'm not paying yeah it's funny one of my best friends said she learned in therapy so as with all good therapists you learn from your friends who learned in therapy certain things yeah. right so one of the things she's learned is that we try not to say but but say and more so I, that's why i just caught myself there so we love to give and it can risk burnout Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like we are grateful that so many people reach out to us and sometimes we have to say no. Uh -huh. But it's a tricky one. Sometimes I think in HR, we're sort of like it's one or the other. We either say yes to everything and do for everyone and we're people pleasing our butts off. And we're just yeah. so concerned that, you know, one person won't like us. It's like, or the, or we just don't do any of it. It's like, no, there's an in-between, right? Yeah. We are generous. We are loving. We are givers. We are caring. And turns out we need to also take time for ourselves. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And you reminded me of that last week. Like I said, gosh, I've been just saying yes to everyone, Kelly, and it's so energizing and it's fun. And you're like, right, but are you also saying yes to yourself? And I was like, oh no, like I haven't taken one nap since March. I haven't taken a day off since March. Like perhaps also uh, practice what we preach. It's important. So it's kind of like holding ourselves accountable too and admitting that it's hard to do. It's yeah. hard to set boundaries. Yeah. Right. Obviously, it was easy. We would all do it so much more frequently. Well, yeah, it would be. And again, I think where you said, you know, from an HR perspective, like we we are naturally givers. I think we are naturally kind of people pleasers, if you like, to our detriment. You know, like we want to we want to be serving. We want to be adding value. We want to keep going. We want to keep driving. We don't like saying no to people. Right. All of that kind of stuff. But ultimately, you know, it's going to come back and bite us on the arse, isn't it? Because, you know, we have, you know, from my perspective, I know we've spoken about it before, like my burnout in 2013 was linked in part to the kind of toxic relationship that I was in. But like I was also trying to prove, and I don't know who I was trying to prove it to, but I was also trying to prove that I could be the best HR director and I could be responsible for like 10 different projects and I could be commuting for four hours a day and I could be a good mom and I could be a good and I could do all of these things and yet the one thing I wasn't doing was looking after myself yeah you know what I often come back to is like who are they like when my my inner voice does that like they'll be disappointed they yeah. will they will want yeah. more they're gonna think it's not enough like who are they who am I really concerned about yeah but sometimes this illusion and I think this people pleasing idea, it's like not something to dismiss. And I know when I mention it, so many HR people cringe and they're like, not me, not me. They don't, it's like they want to resist it. And I'm like, just take a minute and think about it. Like, mm -hmm. I actually think there's a lot of societal pressure on us, especially as women. And most of us in HR are women. So keep that in mind. There's societal pressure on us to keep doing, to, to, I learned a phrase on, on Twitter recently, over functioner, right? We want to over function, overdo. Yeah. Yeah. We want to, we're so worried that if we drop the ball once, like, and so what I've been trying to do to counteract it is really talk to anyone I am talking to about it. So if they apologize to me, oh, sorry, I'm two minutes late. I'll say, why are you apologizing? Like, what is that about for you? Yeah. Like, let's address it, right? Why are we so panicked that I didn't reply to your email fast enough? No one's. And maybe there is someone who's going to judge it for you, but that's like, it's just too much worry. Yeah, but again, I think like who, like you said with the they, I know through a lot of the HR people that I coach, you know, it's like, well, you know, the leaders or the exec, or they they will be worried about this or they will be worried about that. You know? And I'm like, okay, so how how do you know that they're going to think that? How do you know that that's what they got? Well, 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 I don't. Yeah. So have you ever asked them? Right. Uh, no. Okay, so what do you think they might say if you ask them? Or actually, why don't you go and ask them and like find out what's going to be the case? Nine times out of ten, it isn't what they thought it would be. Oh, you know, I, there was one uh, one woman that I started working with recently, and um, so she she'd contacted me months and months ago. Like, I, I want you know, I want to I want to you know, I want to coach. I've seen all of the stuff that you do. I really really want to work with you. And then kind of lockdown hit and she was like, oh, I don't know. This actually is two women now I said now I say this, two HR directors. Um, and they had both said to me they were gonna self-fund. So it was okay, fine. So I'd had some, you know, discovery calls with them, we'd had these conversations. Um, and then when we kind of got to the point of like talking payment, and it was, you know, it was like, so okay, so I just want to double check your self-funding, like you, you know, your chief exec or whoever isn't gonna pay for this for you. No, but actually I've never asked them. Okay, fine. So anyway, both of these HR directors have gone back to their chief exec. So one is one's a chief exec, one's a managing director. And both said, I'm thinking of doing this coaching. These are the reasons why. This is how much it's going to cost. And in both cases, they've both said they will pay. So it's like, oh, so that, you know, that's that saved that saved me the money. But you know, part of the conversations that I then had with them is actually, why did you think that they wouldn't? Right. Like, why did you think you had to do this yourself? Yeah. Why did you think that? You know, was it because you were seeing coaching as a negative? Was it because you didn't know what they would say? What, you know, what did it kind of come down to? And it was that kind of voice in our head. It was the, you know, they will say. Yeah. I should. I don't want to disappoint them. Yeah. Right? I don't want to ruffle yeah. the feathers. Don't want yeah. to upset them. Yeah. 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 Or they will think. 
when when you and I talk to so many CEOs, I mean, the same happens with my recruitment fees, right? So heads of HR will say, we're not able to use an external agency. We don't have the budget. Absolutely not. And then I'll talk to a CEO and they're like, of course, of course, we want the best search firm on it. T tell head of HR, yes. And then I'll go back to HR and they're, or, you know, oh, I just assumed he would say no because they only say yes to legal and finance, but never to our team. Well, maybe it's because you're not asking and you're not standing up for yourself in a way that doesn't have to be so abrasive and we don't have to go into taker mode, but it's the idea of like you are worthy of boundaries, of limits, of help, of external help. And I see it. It's like a really bizarre and yet we all do it like a resistance of getting the help that we need. And we're making up a lot of stories, as you said, like it's not even real per se. You yeah. actually might have the budget. You might actually be able to take the day off. You might actually be able to work from home. You might actually be able to all these things. You just haven't really asked or assumed yet. Yeah. And, and do you think we stay in that kind of victim, right? We, it's, yeah. it's a weird, like we stay down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, so I think, you know, linking, linking back to, again, the, the conversation that we were having, like, do you think some of that is, and I was, I was thinking about this in the car, actually, on, on, the, on the way today, that was like, is there something, but as if we don't set the boundaries for ourselves, we can't, like, if, so, it, like, if we can't say what we want, or we can't say yes, or we can't say no, we can't have those boundaries for ourselves we're then less likely to have boundaries for other people. So again, I was I was kind of linking this back again to like the conversation where we got to a point where like people would own, like people were asking us questions like a thousand times a day, like help me with this, help me with this, help me with this. And I know in one instance, like you'd guided somebody to one of the workshops that you were running, like, okay, if you want this help, come to this work. Oh, no, 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 I just want you to find me a job. Like I, I know I've asked for the help, but I don't need it. But also then internally, how that plays out for HR is I think maybe some of the expectations that we have for other people across the business. So if I don't have the boundaries for myself, let's say you work in sales or marketing or legal or wherever, I come to ask you something and you're always like, I haven't got time to deal with it or I can't do this or no, or that's not my responsibility or whatever. And we as, a, as HR, they get really annoyed by that. Like, why haven't you got the time for me? Why aren't you making this a priority? But actually, those teams have just got boundaries in place, whereas we haven't got the boundaries. And so maybe we're expecting other people to just go into kind of give mode, because if we're doing it, why, you know, if I'm doing it, why aren't you? Yeah, absolutely right. I think it's a vicious cycle. We sort of resent the people who can set boundaries, who have strong self-value, self-worth. We judge people for it. Yeah. I was thinking about that recently. Like how often, we, I'm sure we've all, and again, take the mirror, take a moment. I'm sure we've all heard this. We've all heard an HR person say to someone, maybe to us, can you believe Sally, the HR business partner, is going to ask for 20K more at her review? She's not worth 20K more. That's absurd. Yeah. We've all heard that. Sally is worth 20K more. Sally is confident enough to ask for 20K more. But Cranky Barbara is sad because she doesn't know how to ask for it. So now she judges Sally for it. Yeah. That's the vicious cycle. And it happens all the time. But if Bob and marketing ask for 20K more, you know, that's marketing. They're just better at it. But yeah. like these are skills. If we want to be strategic, if we want to be forward thinking, if we actually want the seat at the table, you have to not judge each other for being more assertive and more confident. Um, I recently wrote a blog. I think you had read it, and and I know we talked about it. We wrote about it around the same time. We both wrote a blog about this, and I had tweeted that like imagine walking into a Ferrari showroom and saying to the sales guy, you know, how much is that car? Oh, it's two hundred thousand. That's absurd. You should be ashamed of yourself for asking that amount of money. That's crazy. I can't imagine and storming out. No one would do that. You would just say, wow, thank you. And maybe go out on the sidewalk and say, oh, it's too bad. I don't have the budget for that. Yeah. I hear HR professionals speaking that way about each other, about their department, about vendors and partners like us. It's coming from such a place of hurt because I don't think they feel like they are the Ferrari and they are like they are worthy of asking for the salary they want, the external coaching they want, the external recruiters they need, the you know, seminars, webinars, wherever they want to go, all of that. 
And yeah, marketing can do it and legal can do it and finance can do it. And instead of resenting them for it, why not learn from them and say, maybe they're onto something. Yeah. They, they just walk in and say, beautiful car. Thanks. Like yeah. one day I'll try yeah. and get it. Like that's it. And that's it, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm Yeah. So beautiful car. I'm going to go and get it. But I wonder like how many, I also wonder like how many HR professionals would actually walk into the Ferrari showroom in the first place? Yeah. Because we're probably, you know, we're, we're probably looking at not to devalue any other cars, um, but, you know, we're, we're probably going into secondhand dealerships uh, yeah. or we're going, you know, we're, we're setting our expectations as, at that cheaper budget in the first place or like we're not even thinking that we're worthy of the car. Like, you know, we're going to cycle everywhere or we're going to Uber everywhere okay. uh, because that would be more effective for us. So, like, I wonder how many... I want to have even get into the showroom to then start asking the question. You have me thinking, is this part of the whole we're non revenue generating? We don't, we, we shouldn't ask for a dollar because, you know, it's like the, <laughs> I was raised Catholic, so I'm laughing, the thinking of the mea culpa, mea culpa. Like this idea of just, you know, uh, this. I, I shouldn't even ask because I don't bring money into the organization. Sales brings money into the organization so they can go to that fancy conference in San Diego. But I, and I, and again, I don't, it's not all HR to blame. It's part of the structure. It's part of the way it's been built. It's, yeah. We're literally unlearning these cultural norms. We are trying to pull back the curtain on some of this, these patterns. And again, I think also, you know, like we, like you, you've got SHRM over in the US, we've got CIPD over, over here in the UK. And I think, again, a lot of it from, from the institutes that govern HR and everything that we do, like I think, I think some of it starts from there. Like we don't, like I've never, not that I go to any of them anymore, but like I've, I've never been to one of those. Like even when I was doing my qualification, there was nothing in there about like the human side of HR, there was nothing about boundaries. There was nothing about coaching. There was nothing about collaboration. There was nothing about emotional intelligence. There was yeah. nothing about self-reflection or self-learning or any of those sorts of things. It was all very process and policy driven. And again, you know, I think from an HR perspective, if if all we are doing, I, I spoke to a group of newly qualified HR professionals a few years ago now, and I was kind of like really fired up. You know, like what is you know? So, what are you really looking forward to in your career, or what changes can you can you do? And and I'm kind of really really fired at you know what what's the role of HR going forward? And like this newly qualified group, we're all like, we're, you know, we're 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 here to make sure that all of the policies are implemented and that the organisation stays safe. And so it's like, okay, so like I was, I mean, I was gobsmacked, but like if that's how we're starting, where is the value in that? Yeah, like I can I can write a policy. Okay, great. I can discipline someone if that policy is not followed. Yeah, okay, great. But most of the HR, you know, and I, and I think I'm really lucky now. A lot of the HR people that I speak to are, you know, are repeating what I have been saying my entire career. Like I'm not a typical HR person. Right. And, you know, I, I I like to, you know I don't like to do it that way. And like great. Like we need more people that are saying they're not typical HR people, but actually I think like that's what we need to be kind of bottling because again, those people that I speak to do have boundaries. They are very clear on what is their role and what the managers need to be doing. They're brilliant at coaching managers. They're brilliant at managing upwards. They've got their seat at the table. They can say, this is how I can add value. They can say, this is the change that we want to make. And yet those that seem to just be kind of like the policy police, like there's no boundaries. It's just like, you know, they get asked to write another policy and they yeah. say yes. They get asked to pick up dry cleaning and they say yes. They get asked yeah. to organise a team lunch and they say yes. And then it's like, but I don't feel valued as an HR professional. Like kind of like, would you? Like you're being you're being yeah. treated like a concierge. Yeah. Would you, Would you kind of say that you're adding value? That's huge. I just, I just had like a, I just had a big light bulb. I had to write it down. Yeah. So it was, it's funny. The other day when I was thinking about this call, I was like, what am I hearing a lot of? And I keep hearing, I feel badly. And you just said, I feel valued. And maybe they're two different 
that's the two different spectrums that we need to look at. So the I yeah. feel badly is what I hear with, well, I would feel badly not to order the lunch because the CEO really needed it and marketing isn't going to do it and who else could do it. And, you know, I oversee office management facilities, administration, marketing, because who else is going to do it? And I feel badly. The I feel valued person or persona or confidence boosting that we can do says, well, I feel valued as an HR leader. And I know the bagels have to be ordered. And I will find someone who can help me do that. Yeah, but, but it's not I my job. Yeah. yeah. And that's it's not like, my We know. have to hear the triggers. Like, we have to hear yeah. that I feel badly. I don't want to disappoint. We have to hear those and then really try and convert them. <laughs> Well, it's like you said earlier, and it, is, and it is the power of that language. It is the power of that mind talk. Like you were referring back to, uh, like the conversation with your friends and their ther therapist. Like you know, this and exactly. But we, but we, we do tend to go into that but scenario. Yeah, you know, I'm a part of one of a um, group that I've I've kind of joined in terms of say say marketing and, and stuff. Um, and like how to get my message across more and, and the woman that's running that like you can be a business owner and have a family and yeah. like you can be visible and be confident you can be confident and be able to kind of tell your story um, and and yeah I you know I think from my perspective like I I always said you know, my, my my career rocketed. What you know, whilst whilst my sons were were growing up, and and I always said that I could do both. But there were times where it felt I had to compromise. You know, if I was at work, I wasn't being a good enough mum. So it what you know, so it felt like choices. If I do this, I cannot do this, and that's where that but would come in. Whereas actually, I think if I had, you know, if I knew now, or if I knew then what I know now. I would have had better boundaries. I would have been replacing all of those buts with ands and I would have been making it happen. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, it's very hard to figure out how to balance it all. And when we're givers, we just go into giving mode first. So, yeah, when I launched my business seven years ago, my social life went completely backseat. Yeah. You know, it was like zone in, focus, yeah. build a business, work hard. Seven years later, this was supposed to be my year of exciting travel and get out more. Fine, <laughs> then a pandemic hit. Um, but I think it literally clicked of like, there's no people pleasing that's going to satisfy the need to actually have a life outside of work. I mean, at some point, yeah. you're worthy of a life that isn't just about pleasing clients and pleasing HR leaders. It's about, yeah. you know, building something for yourself. Yeah. Um, I think the other piece is that like, and I can't stress it enough. And you and I are just so good at it because we practice it so much. It's not fun to set boundaries. It's not easy to set boundaries. And we do it anyway. Uh -huh. Like, I love how we both love Brene Brown. And she always says, you know, speak your truth, even if your voice shakes. Yeah. So saying, Mr. CEO, I'm not going to order bagels for the company party. Your voice might shake when you say that because it is scary to say no and do it anyway. Yeah. It's kind of like I hear so many HR leaders say, well, I don't know how to go back in there and ask for it, or I'm scared to go back in there and ask for it, to pay for your coaching, to pay for my recruitment, to do anything, to take Tuesday yeah. off. They're scared to go in there. And it's like, just go, just go in there. Because frankly, it's not even a huge, long thing you have to say. It's as yeah. simple as, I need to hire an external coach. It costs X. Thanks. Yeah. I'm taking Tuesday off. Thank you. That's it. I mean, you don't think the head of marketing goes in there with this long, verbose, overly dramatic sales pitch. It's just, this is what I need. This is what I want. Can I have it, please? Yeah. 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 And, and it, it is hard, but I think it's like, it's hard and it's okay to do it. It's, you know, you have to practice it. And I think it's, I think it's vitally important that we do it because actually, if the bagels need ordering today and I do it and then they need ordering tomorrow and then next week, like I become the go-to bagel person, like, is that going to get me a seat at the table? Right. And if I'm always, you know, I'm always the one that's got to go and pick this up or drop everything and, and kind of deal with this, like you become the person that will just drop everything 
yeah. to do the stuff that needs doing. Exactly. So from the a, takers will never stop taking. They exactly. will never stop asking. Exactly. So if I, you know, if I, if I'm always the person. And I, I think we've had this conversation before. Like I can remember, like my HRD position, I was reporting. So my my boss, I had just started, and my boss would leave at about four four thirty, go do what needed doing at home, but then start emailing again or clearing emails or whatever at kind of ten o'clock at night, and that that worked for her. And I can remember. I was, um, I had like my first, I was really not long in the job at all. I had my first board meeting coming up the following day. And so I got home late anyway. And I sat kind of going through everything on my laptop, making sure that I knew every single bit of these papers for the next day. Like I needed to go in and smash this board meeting. And as I'm sat going through this stuff on the, com on the computer, like my boss had emailed me. And it was about half 11 at night and I responded and I, I got this reply back from her, you never reply to any emails past 7 p.m. And if you can stop like stop them earlier than that, then do. But never reply to anything after 7 p.m. Because if you do it once, people will begin to expect it of you. Yeah. And if you become the person that is always picking up emails at 11.30 at night, you will be the go-to person for any issues as they occur because you will be the 11.30 at night person. And then you won't be able to switch off at 11.30 at night because you will have set the precedent that you are the 11.30 at night. So you don't reply to any emails. And she'd give him, and I was like, yeah, that really, really makes sense. Like, thank you. Like, you've given me permission to set some boundaries. You've said it works for you. I don't need to be doing it. That's absolutely fine. But I then sent her a response immediately back, right, to say, thanks very much for that. Uh, really useful. I won't do it again. She just sent me one back. You've just replied. <laughs> So like, okay, like I, I don't know what to do, but it was that kind of. Had she not have said that, I would have become the eleven thirty at night person because again, being new into that business and not really understanding how things work. Like if my boss is working at eleven thirty at night, like loads of other people must be working at eleven thirty at night. So clearly, you've got to be on your laptop at eleven thirty at night, but. She helped me to set that boundary yeah. at that point yeah. that enabled me to work very differently. I know. I'm always thankful for the people who are who help us, who help each other. And we certainly do it for each other and for others, okay. hopefully, where I've had clients tell me to raise my fees because they yeah. feel yeah. like I'm undervaluing. That's amazing. And I'm very grateful for that. There are people who've been able to tell me when it's enough. Like, yeah. you know, it's that's enough. If you don't have to do any more, that's you're worthy of being here just by doing A, B, and C. You don't have to do J, D through Z. Um, so we have to keep teaching each other. And I think it's, it bums me out because I think what I hear a lot of is, you know, but I don't want to be seen as selfish or I want to make sure people know I'm generous or it's not even about that. You're, you're not going to suddenly become unkind. Like it doesn't work that way, right? It's, Boundary setting doesn't mean you're not now mean. You're now grumpy. It's no, not I like a from our perspective, is like we've said before, it says I have self-worth. It yeah. says I am of value and I value myself. I think it says that I I role model. And I you know, I, th I think it says all of those things. And again, I think as as we've both said, like we 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 just need to I think we can be better leaders when we are able to role model. Yeah. But again, I think what we see a lot of in HR is we tell people to have boundaries. We tell people to get plenty of rest. We tell people not to work long hours. We tell people the importance of development. We tell people all of these things and we don't do any of it ourselves. And I think sometimes that's where we can lose some of that credibility because if we, if we can't role model it, we're yeah. showing that we have no boundaries. We're showing that we have no time. We're showing that we can't do all of these things that we're saying are important. Like, where's the credibility in that? Like, if you tell me, like, the importance of recruiting, like, the importance of working with you, like, everything, like, or job searching, like, so I'm an HR candidate from a job search. If you tell me all of that, but you're not doing it yourself or you're, do, you're off doing something completely different. Like where's the credibility? Actually, I'm going to go and find a recruiter that is credible 
and that does know what she's talking about and we'll kind of take it from there like we've got right. to be we have to be the role model surely such a great point it's such a great point and it goes back to what you're saying about this need to talk about human emotion in hr because it's not about look we can talk about data and metrics and ai and all of this and we should and you have to be willing to look inward before you do any of that work yeah. because if you show up to all of those conversations as a robot there's no ability to self-reflect or grow or evolve and the best leaders are doing that i mean all the people we've admired since march are the ones who've shown up vulnerably as themselves willing to have tough conversations that are emotional and sensitive and hard yeah. and i i think and again, it's not all HR pros to blame. It's partly the way it's been conditioned and developed and the way that we've always looked at HR as cold and guarded and the policy police and and saving the company money, not spending a dime and not yeah. investing in anything. And well, it's now you have to spend money to have better employee engagement processes and better training and development programs and better recruitment processes. I mean, it is an investment. It's not, yeah. and maybe 20 years ago, you could get away with, spending not a dime I just think it's times have evolved so you have to evolve with it yeah and I think there's also you know like you said an HR definitely aren't all to blame with this I think what I have been reflecting on over the last few weeks actually is the organizations that I see particularly because there is such a spotlight on so many organizations as a result of COVID but the organizations that really do seem to be thriving and again we we spoke at the beginning of lockdown like if we stay visible if we keep doing everything that we need to do like we we will thrive as a result of this as we start to come out the other end because people will know that we exist people will you know people will have listened to all of those sorts of things but over the last few months i think as i look at the organizations where that are putting their people first and and you know that's a that's a big thing for me the, the business owners, the leaders that are putting their people first, value their people. And if you speak to, this is my experience, people may tell me, tell me differently, but if you speak to then those leaders and their people people or their HR people or whoever, the HR people feel valued. The HR people feel that they have a voice and the HR people can say that people matter within this organization. Where we have leaders who do not put their people first, they're not valuing their HR, they don't want to invest in their HR, and therefore the HR are at a disconnect, or do feel undervalued, or are the people out picking up the bagels because nobody else will do it. And so I, I do think a lot of it has to come from leaders. Yeah. And I think from an HR perspective, yeah. and I've like I've I've been there. I remember joining one organization who had headhunted me because of a lot of the changes that I'd implemented with the previous company. And I can remember at my interview thinking, oh, like, I, I don't know, like something about the culture, something about the fit, something about the leadership wasn't there. But I told myself this was a challenge, right? If I can turn this business around right. from an HR perspective, like I will have succeeded. Like my job will have been done, everything will have been worthwhile. It nearly killed me in the process yeah. because the leadership team didn't give a toss about the people. Right. They were never going to have like the right culture. They were never going to be living or breathing the same values. But I saw it as a challenge. And I think lots of HR people are in the same boat. Like they go into organizations knowing that they're the wrong organization yeah. because they see it as a challenge. But ultimately, then I think that stops us from being able to create some of these boundaries because we're not respected People are, you know, people, all of the people stuff is like, it's, it's done by HR. Like we as leaders don't have to do it. Managers don't have to do it. The people really don't have to do it. It's seen as this task that's given to HR as something that you just do. Yeah. And therefore it can be more difficult to set the boundaries because I think we go into, that's where I think we go into, but I have to be the one. We have to be the team that are doing it because nobody else is going to and we know that it matters. We're good at it. We're, we're good, good at it. We're brilliant at it. We can do it really quickly and we can do it easily. So I think we can like, we go into that because we know it's important, but we know nobody else is going to do it. Yeah. Whereas actually what we should be doing is shouting louder, this needs doing and it's not my job. We are all in this people stuff together. We've all got to be collaborating. Yeah, exactly. And let's not fear 
that that will be perceived as you're greedy and selfish and mean and all the other words I hear when I bring this topic up because it's not true. You can be kind and have self-worth. You can be generous and have boundaries. Yeah. It's really interesting because I remember when the phrase strategic HR business partner started coming up as opposed to HR manager or HR generalist. SHR. In the early days, yeah. Yeah. and in the early days, I would ask people, "So, what? You know, describe this to me. What is this new? What is this new role? This new phrase?" Yeah. And really, the main thing I would hear was, "We want to empower the business lines, the business managers, to do more of the work themselves." So we're going to coach them and lead them to do the performance management, to do the training, to even just to to handle their teams. We're going to better prepare them to be the ones to lead it. And I thought, well, how awesome. I mean, it's really about HR educating, influencing, guiding, and having boundaries so they're not cleaning up every single mess in a 3,000-person organization, which for years we were doing. And But I think – so. Yes, it's wonderful. I just don't know if everyone is caught up with that concept or really know how to do that. Because I know even for me in recruiting, it's like I am, again, I'm good at it and I enjoy it. So I'm happy to do everything involved. Like build the behavioral interview questions, build out the competencies, rewrite the job description. Because I feel like maybe that's how I validate the fee I'm charging, right? I have to do everything. When actually it's better even to charge that same fee and let the hiring manager partner with me and do a lot of it themselves. So they learn and they're empowered and it's a true team effort and it's not all on me. Right. And that's taken time and practice to, for me to evolve. And certainly for managers who've said to me, look, I'm paying you regardless. Don't worry about it. Just let me do some of it too. So, you know, it's, and I, and I think often about in-house HR, in-house recruiters who feel like they have to, justify their work by doing so much and I know it because I've been there and then you say like wait aren't I worthy even if I teach and educate and influence yeah but I can I do wonder and I just I've literally just before jumping on this call with you I've just been running a high performing HR workshop for uh for a company and I think like we we say we want to be more strategic we say we want to do more coaching but I, I think we still have a bit of this disconnect between what we think we're here to deliver mm-hmm. and what the business expects from HR. So I think where we've had some of the challenges around those strategic HR business partners and you know every organization now needs HR business partners and it is gonna be more strategic and it's gonna be this and it's gonna be that and it's gonna be the other. But at some point, it, it kind of feels like we missed a trick in saying to the business, this is now what we're gonna do. Yeah. And this is the journey and this is the transition and this is how we're going to help you get to that perspective. It sometimes, you know, like I'm, I think I commented on something yesterday. Like if I, throughout my HR career, I have worked like it's been called staff and training, personnel, HR, um, HR and change, HR and culture, uh, people and change, people and culture, people team. Um, we've gone from, as you said, like we've gone from, you know, personnel managers to HR managers to strategic HR business partners, people partners, people partners um, heads of HR, strategic heads of HR, operational heads of HR, functional heads of HR. Like we've got all of these job titles, and I, I kind of think, you know, like <laughs> that I get, was really fun, Kelly. I really, yes. we, need your, we need your video editor to clip that. That's amazing. I think you just listed them all. Yeah. So good. Well, like, it's like it feels like we've spent so much bloody time talking about what we're going to call ourselves, right. but we haven't invested the same amount of time getting the business to understand what it is that we're here for right. or working collaboratively with, collaboratively with the business to say, right, what do you think HR is? Yeah. How do you want it to work for you? This is what we think it is and this is how we think it can work. How can we work together? Because it does seem that there's like this – HR want to be the strategic coaches and, you know, you'll know, you know, loads of the stuff that we're, we're doing at Chrysalis and you're like really, really innovative stuff. And it's like, yeah, you're like we'd love that, but we'd never get the leadership team on board. Yeah, we'd love that, but it would never work at my business. Yes, we'd love that, but this will never happen. And then we get the people that come in and we're like, yeah, right, we want to work with you because we want to do this, this and this. The organizations that we're working with seem to be, from an HR perspective, the HR and leadership teams are so much more aligned 
than those that like, Kelly, I really love all the stuff that you're doing, but it will never work at my business. So how are they creating that alignment, Kelly? How are they doing a better job of that when they're... Again, I think some of it starts, I, th I think it is that, I, so I think there's a, there's a few things. I think some of that does start with the leaders. So again, as I said earlier, like the leaders that value people value HR. Yeah. So therefore, you're automatically starting off on a better foot than you would do if, a, you know, if the leadership okay. team don't value HR. Yeah. But I also think when HR can, and this team that I've just done some work with, like they like speak to the business. What do you, What do you think we're here to do? What do you need from us? What do you want from us? How can we create it? What would you say great HR looks like? What would like what would great HR look like for you as a recruiting manager? What would it look like for you in sales? What would it look like in IT? What would it look like in legal? And start to shape that because actually from an operations perspective, HR may look very different than it might do in IT. Yeah. But we go to this kind of one size fits all approach. This is HR and everything that we're here to do. And, but actually, we want you to be doing it for yourselves. But you can't do it for yourselves because we need you to follow this set of rules that we've created for you. So if you don't do it our way, we can't support you. Yeah. But we don't want it doing your way because then you probably don't need HR. Yeah. There it is. It's like a scarcity. It's a fear yeah. that you might not need us anymore if we don't do it all. Yeah. And that's really unfortunate. And, you know, I look now that you say it, I've never really made the connection that a people oriented company really values HR. I mean, look how many big companies that we know that I will not name here, but we can Google who've laid off like 80 percent of their HR team in this crisis yep. because it was, you know, a non revenue generating department. We didn't see the value. And that says a lot about the organization as a whole. Uh -huh. And then those HR people, unfortunately, are coming out battered. This happened in 2009 of feeling really undervalued and, un, of course, and, un, you know, unworthy. And so we're kind of perpetuating a cycle. And I'm not to say that every layoff is about lack of value. But frankly, in a lot of these cases, it was because other departments were kept completely intact. And it was HR that was the first to go. Yeah. And so there's definitely some food for thought around the scarcity, the fear of job security, the fear of. You know, if I don't overachieve, if I don't overfunction, if I don't overperform, do I even have a place here? And it's like a very deep rooted issue. Yeah. But like, again, we'll have both heard like how many organizations, how many managers, how many people in organizations are like, I don't even, I, I don't know what HR does. Yeah. Right. I don't know what HR does. Like, my ex husband was convinced that I just sacked people all day. My sons, when I like my son, I probably I'd had the business probably three years before my sons really understood what it was that I did. Um, and you know, there's there's all of those sorts of things, but but I, I hear repeatedly like I don't know what HR do. And yeah. sometimes when I start working with HR teams, it's like, but the business doesn't know what we do. And again, from a boundary setting perspective, if we're saying yes to all of the crap that nobody else wants to do, like how would you explain that to somebody? Like, how would you quantify, I do the crap that nobody else wants to do, even though none of that is in my, like, none of that's my remit, none of that's in my job, none of that's what I'm here to do. But if every single hiring manager thinks that I just pick up the crap for them, of course, when it comes to making redundancies, they're going to think that I'm not needed because yeah. all they is that I pick up the crap for them. Well, actually, if it's then like, well, we can start picking up our own crap, it's like, okay, fine. Such a really interesting discussion. I, I'm having so many epiphanies about this because I often, I'm so visual, so I think of a mirror, right? And I'm always thinking about like being self-reflective, but actually all these issues are kind of twofold. It's like putting the mirror out to the leadership to yeah. say like, tell us what you think about HR really. And that's why I encourage people when they're interviewing for new HR jobs, really understand the philosophy of HR in that company. Yeah. If it, as you said, if it's completely misaligned and they think of you as just, like a menial task force just you don't go there it's okay like go go somewhere where at least at the basis there's a value um i, I don't know i mean i find it really complicated because it's like it's, it's twofold as you said the leaders have to do some of their own work i don't think the answer is that hr has to keep selling themselves and keep like it's almost over the top now it's like Mm -hmm. You know, every HR leader is going in there defending their department, defending their value, defending their work. Yeah. It's almost making it worse. Like, 
I don't think Sophia Loren walks in a room and is like, I'm beautiful. Let me tell you 50 ways I am. It just, it just is, right? The Ferrari doesn't ask for for a wholesale. The Ferrari is, is a well-run machine. That's how it works. And I think every HR leader and every HR pro at every level needs to walk in a room and know they're their own Ferrari, their own Sophia Loren, their own Gucci handbag, whatever. Have that sense of value. Have that sense of confidence. Not everyone will see it, right? But it, it's funny. I'm I'm doing a um, speaking engagement. I know you're very proud of me because I have. I'm, I'm very, very proud of you. Yeah. You did the speaking circuit. Um, I tease because it's it's all online now. But anyway, um, Bamboo HR, which is an HR tech company, they're having me uh, do their virtual uh, speaker on the virtual summit next month. They specifically reached out to me and asked me to speak on HR self worth. They said, you know, you tweeted, talk, and blog a lot about this, and I don't really think HR people think about it. It's really important that they're self-confident. And I was like, I'm happy to talk about that because we could talk about it for months and years. Yeah. It's, I think that that's the core issue. If you can walk in a room with that type of confidence, then yeah, some people won't see your value and that's fine, but don't let one of those people be you. Mm. Like that, I don't know. I, you know, I remember years ago, someone saying to me, so if a hundred people in a room like you, or there's a hundred people in the room and 99 people like you and one doesn't, are you focused on that one? And I was like, yeah, of course I want to convert that one. And make, it's exhausting. I and mean, the, the reality is, no, you don't focus on that one. You focus on the 99 and you keep doing your own thing. And so I think it's this perpetuated cycle of lack of self-esteem in HR. And then that's why they can't set boundaries and why we struggle with it. Cause we're trying to hustle for the, for the worst. Yeah. Whereas when we create better boundaries and have more self-worth and self-belief, we automatically create more value. Yeah. In creating more value, we are more valued and therefore we make bigger changes within the business. And you know, you and I have had conversations over and over again, haven't we? It's, it is like chicken and egg scenario. Like what needs to happen first? What needs to happen first? What yeah. needs to happen first? And it's it's kind of like it it kind of all needs to happen at the same time from lots of different directions. It does. But it has to start with us. And, you know, again, we've had this conversation many, many times, like a lot of the work that we do with the crew, a lot of the coaching stuff that I do, a lot of that isn't telling HR or developing HR in how to do HR differently. A lot of that is increasing the confidence and self-value and self-worth of you as the HR professional because you cannot change an organization, you cannot transform HR, you cannot transform culture, you cannot have greater presence and impact with the exec team if it's not starting with you. There it is. You know, so fundamentally, that's so much of what we do. Like, I know you can do HR. I don't want to teach you how to do HR. Yeah. But in helping you be more confident, in helping you be more visible, in helping you have more presence and being able to create more impact and believing in the value that you're creating you will be delivering different, better, new, innovative, creative HR. Like that's yeah. the starting point for me. Yeah. And sometimes less is more, right? To set a boundary, sometimes it's just saying no. Yeah. I cannot. No, I cannot review your nephew's resume. I cannot do an hour of free coaching. I cannot order the bagels. And yeah. you don't have to over explain it. It's just no Thank you. Thank but you for reading that. Excuses. We do go into excuses, don't oh, we? Like, many no, I can't do that because I'm too busy today. Oh, but then that kind of okay. So if you're too busy today, what about tomorrow? And then it's like I haven't got an excuse for tomorrow. So yeah, okay, I'll do it for mm -hmm. you. And it's like we don't have to make excuses. We You've heard the phrase "no" is a complete sentence. Complete sentence. Absolutely, no is a complete sentence. Like it's a complete response. No, I can't do it. Yeah. And, and the same like boundary setting is also about as you said, saying yes too, like saying yes to your coaching. So people freak out and they'll say, or to my course or whatever, my recruitment, yeah. people will say, well, I know I'm not going to get the budget or I don't really know how to go in there and defend it or ask for it or explain it. What should I say? And I'm like, you just go in there and confidently say, I need an external recruitment expert. She is going to help us hire better. This is the cost. Please sign off. I need to hire an external coach. She is going to help me be in a better HR leader. This is the cost. Please sign off. Yeah. That's it. You don't have to go in there with a two hour long PowerPoint presentation yeah. and explaining yourself. It's or, making it worse. Yeah. <laughs> like, or get yourself in a position. And again, I see this with so many HR, like so many other managers and leaders across the organization, senior managers across the organization, like they don't have to ask for budget. No. 
right? You just maybe see the invoice that comes across your desk because they have hired a coach, they have hired an external recruiter, they have mm -hmm. arranged a workshop or development program for their team. Like they're not asking permission. They're saying, I have X amount in my budget and this is what I want to spend it on. And yet I couldn't tell you the amount of HR people that want to develop but feel that they have to go and ask permission before spending any of their budget on that thing. Like, why are we asking permission in the first place? I know we're not children, right? There's this no. odd, like, subservient role that yeah. is played in this profession. And like, if you're HR director, you will be responsible, I would guess, for some kind of mega budget across the organization. The fact that you could, like you don't feel that you can spend any of that on yourself without seeking permission or having to, you know, think of all of the reasons or or not even asking in the first place in case, in case somebody says no to me. Like you're an HR director in an organization that trusts you to be able to do that job. Like at what point of that did you do you then feel it's like I need to go and ask if I can do some development that I know is going to better me and better the HR function and therefore better the business. It's really, when you say it that way, it shocks me that it even happens. But it does, doesn't it? It like, happens we, every day. Right, right, I need to ask permission. Like, who the hell are we asking permission for? Like, we're, if we're who the Who are they? Who yeah. are these people? The CEO <laughs> is happy to do it. <laughs> the CEO is like, what? What is this money? I mean, we're, the company's making millions of dollars a year. Your little training program, it's, it's yeah. not going to break the bank here. I know. Yeah. It's this lack of self-esteem. It's this lack of taking up space, right? And as women, many of us are conditioned this way. Don't take up too much room. Don't be too loud. Don't. It's, it's done. We're so past it now. Like, stand up in your power. Ask. Just not even ask. Yeah, just get what you need know what you need get what you need there's no shame there's no guilt i mean i'm sure you and i have both heard like people will say i'm ready to hire you i didn't think i would do it i hesitated i right because there's so much shame and like getting help getting support yep it's, it's like we have to stop that pattern it's not weakness to need help it's not weakness to say no it's actually strong to say no and say yes and know what you need and from an hr perspective like if we were talking is that it is that that kind of and like you said earlier it's that mirror isn't it like if you were talking to any other manager across the business outside of hr what would you be telling them to do yeah if you were talking to any other person in the organization what would you be telling them to do how would you be coaching them? How would you be advising? Mm -hmm. How would you be doing all of this stuff? And yet again, when it comes to us as HR, it's like, oh, I'd never really thought of it like that. Or no, mm -hmm. I didn't think I could do that. Or yeah, yeah, but actually, but if you were another manager, yeah, what would you be telling them? Oh yeah, well, obviously. We have to stop making it where HR is the exception to the rule. Yeah. Like HR pros are employees too. Yeah. HR pros are leaders too. Yeah. And we're people. And we need support. You know, again, you and I have had, I don't know how many conversations, like who is supporting HR? Yeah. Where is the HR for we HR? Are, everybody. For, yeah, <laughs> we, we are. are. Uh, but like, but. We have committed our life to this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it's so, it's such an underserved community. And it's, it's really, and I think when I give this tough love and we talk about these things, I know people cringe. I know this will be hard for some people to hear because it will wake up some parts of themselves they don't like and don't want to face. But the part of self-awareness that's so powerful is you have to face those icky parts. Like, yes, it stinks to admit you've done this, do this, or, you know, doing it today. But, like, release the judgment and just move forward. And I think the key is also to find other HR professionals like we have with each other to hold each other accountable and admit it and say, I need help. I've, I just found myself people, people pleasing last week. Can you talk me through it? Have you been there? How did you get through it? You know, it's not a secret anymore that we all struggle with this. So I think the more we talk as a community, I know HR historically was so private and guarded about these things, but the more we shed light to it, I think the quicker we'll see it evolve. Well, it is, and, and like you can still catch yourself. So Again, like last week, I think we, we had a catch up. When did we have a catch up? Thursday? Thursday afternoon. So a client had um, had sent me an email like, you know, we, we need to speak to you this week. And I've booked out 
sometime tomorrow. It's my birthday on Thursday. I've booked off Friday. And so I've got, like, I've got my diary blocked out. And in between that, like we were having this conversation, I've been delivering a workshop. I've, you like, I've had client work and I was about to respond to this client. Like I can fit you in on Wednesday afternoon or Friday. Like I was like, I'm not doing it on my birthday, but I'm happy. Like I was like, I'll, I'll email you and tell you that I'll do it with you on Wednesday or Friday. And then I had to catch myself because I should have had by now, like I have had three trips this year that have been cancelled. And I know lots and lots of people have been in exactly the same boat. But also like you, I haven't taken a huge amount of time off. I may have had a day here or there or an afternoon here or there. But if I haven't been working with clients, I've been doing videos, I've been writing, I've been blogging, I've been reading, I've been learning, I've been doing all of this stuff. I've been spending time with my sons because they've also been working at home. I've been sorting house, you know, I've been doing all of this stuff. And I had to catch myself just before I sent this, this email on Thursday because particularly, I think, because obviously then I was reflecting on our conversation. I knew we were having this conversation today. Like I can't talk about boundaries if I'm going to break every boundary that I've set myself because I know I need a break just to fit somebody in. And that's not that that client isn't important and that they don't matter. I know. But it's also that I matter. Right. Yeah. We're scared. Yeah. yeah. I also matter yeah. and I cannot continue to keep giving and giving and giving and giving and giving if I do not set those boundaries for myself and firstly it makes me a complete hypocrite yeah. secondly it's going to wear me out and thirdly I'm going to have nothing left to give so I had to go back to say if you want to speak to me this is the only time that I've got available on Tuesday and after that you're going to have to wait a week and that's yeah. exactly what I did but my initial thought was I will squeeze you in to the time that I have dedicated for myself and I stopped it. So yeah. like we we know that we need to be doing yeah. this, stuff, but that doesn't mean that we always get it right. And that doesn't mean that we won't always fall thank into you. Trap. Yeah, thank you for sharing it because we've all been there and it, it never it doesn't get easier. We're just able to catch it sooner. Yeah. You know, they say in exercise, you the more you work out, like the quicker your recovery time, that's how this yeah. kind of work is. You're you'll still go down that road, but you'll be quicker at catching it. And yeah. that's all we can ask we're all there i mean i know so many people who write an email and then go back and take out all the i'm sorry and all. <laughs> whatever habit works for you just start to position yourself as powerful as valuable yeah and like it, you'll see a big shift in the way people treat you back it is but yeah we have to keep catching it you have we, we have 30 seconds left and i want to say happy happy birthday this week oh, very you. exciting Thanks, and i can't wait to celebrate in real life when the world opens I know we're going to go traveling. Mm. We're going to do road trips. We we'll talk to all you HR people in real life. You can yeah, book us at all sorts real. of things. Kelly and Laura on tour. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. So, I suppose just quickly, have you got like one one tip for setting boundaries that you would share? Talk to somebody else in HR about it. We're here to just talk about it when you feel like you're starting to say, "I feel badly." Find someone to talk it through. Yeah, fab. I think mine would be, as Laura kind of said as, as well, I think like practice saying no. Like if you have to say it in a mirror, if you have to practice it with people at home, if you have to practice it with friends, if you have to do it, but practice saying no without the excuses. Yeah, perfect. And Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on LinkedIn. That's where I am most of the time. But I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at Eastside Staff and we'll see each other soon thank you kelly this was so fun today it's been lovely thank you and we will i think laura and i will be uh we'll be sorting out a regular slot We're yeah, gonna let us know what else you want us to talk about of course message yeah. kelly and we'll keep interesting topics going but at least for the next week try and think about ways you can stand in your power and set some boundaries perfect Awesome. thank you everybody so if you were live thank you for joining us if you weren't live i hope you enjoyed the recording um and we'll uh We'll keep working the tech out and see where we go from here, but we're going to get it right eventually. So thank you very much. Take care for now, everybody. Bye. Bye.